Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Racial Equity and Child Welfare's webinar, Race, Equity, and Ethics, Questions on Child Welfare and Predictive Analytics. My name is Tashara Halyard. I am a senior associate at the Center for the Study of Social Policy, where I lead the Alliance for Racial Equity and Child Welfare. The Alliance is pleased that our presenter today is Dr. Jesse Russell from the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. Jesse joined NCCD in 2013 and oversees the organization's systems improvement group focused on engaging social services agencies and as well as other stakeholders in using data to drive system improvements. His research on child welfare, juvenile justice, courts, and system improvements has appeared in many publications including the Journal of Juvenile Justice, Children and Youth Services Review in Psychology, Public Policy, and the Law. Today's webinar is the third in a series on predictive analytics and child welfare. All three you will find archived on CSSP's website, cssp.org, under the Media Center tab. In our series, we've heard from the state of Oregon and also Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, on how they created and implemented their predictive modeling tools. We dug deeper into the role of implicit bias in predictive analytics with the public consulting group in our second webinar. And in today's presentation, we'll explore the structural factors that bring families to the front door of our child welfare systems and how these factors should be considered when implementing predictive modeling tools. Jesse will also share how these tools can support systems efforts to actually increase equity. Before we get started, however, just a few housekeeping measures to note. First, this webinar is being recorded and the presentation will be sent to all registrants at the end of the presentation. Everyone currently is in listen-only mode, so please submit your questions using the chat feature. Also, questions will be collected and asked at the end of Jesse's presentation today. I will turn it over to Jesse. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jesse Russell. We're going to be talking a little bit about predictive analytics today in, in, in child protection, especially with this focus on the ethical side of how you could use predictive analytics, going into the equity and race question, and also asking a question about the overall efficacy uh, of predictive analytics for system reform efforts and for ensuring that we're working towards an equitable child protection system. I really do encourage uh, everyone to ask questions. I think there's a lot of good questions to be asked, and I won't be able to cover everything going through. So if you have questions, I encourage you to ask them via the, the chat box, and we'll, we'll be able to get to them at the end. I also want to point out that predictive analytics is, is, is a topic that has a lot of different angles, a lot of different meanings. People use different words in different ways. And for today, I'm going to be focusing a lot less on any of the technical aspects of what predictive analytics is. I'm not going to talk about any statistics or any data specifically, and I'm not going to be going into any of the uh, considerations of around data sharing or memorandums of understanding for getting data and using data, but really instead of those more nuts and bolts pieces or any of the um, statistical side of things, to be talking about how predictive analytics can be best understood as a tool for people who want to do a better job of, of child protection and moving child welfare efforts in the United States forward. Let me start with this. This is a, a screenshot that probably a lot of you recognize. This is a screenshot from Netflix. In this screenshot, you can see that what it says in the top left corner is these are top picks for you. What this is, this is an example of predictive analytics in, in practice. Predictive analytics is something that almost every consumer-based website uses these days. It's, it's ubiquitous for sure. And Netflix uses it quite a bit. And what, how they use it is a pretty clever way. What they In this screenshot, you can see that there are tw 12 different shows it's recommending to the, 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 the customer here. And Netflix is making these recommendations based on the past history of the person whose account this is, 
along with the past history of everybody else who's ever had an account. Netflix has dug through all these data and tried to find patterns not just in what people watch and what people like, but in patterns in the kinds of people they are. So Netflix takes this information about all of your past viewing habits, along with a bunch of information about where you live and what your zip code is and what kind of uh, neighborhood you're from, along with some demographic things around they can figure out your race or your age or your gender. They take all of that and they try to figure out which typology you fit better. Who is it? that you're most similar to in terms of other watchers. And they try to figure out essentially what kind of person you are, what kind of watcher you are of Netflix videos, and then groups you in with other people who watch Netflix, and then gives you recommendations based on that. The idea is once they know what kind of watcher they, you are, they can figure out what other watchers like you liked and recommend those things to you. And that's clever. In this way, you're now not just logging in the Netflix looking at there are a hundred different thousand movies and shows for you to pick from. Instead, they're giving you some good options that they think there's a good chance that you will like one of these shows. Now for Netflix, how they do this, it's actually pretty, pretty low cost. You can see that they've made 12 recommendations here for you, not just one, and they really only need you to like or watch one of those 12. The other 11 it doesn't really hurt them in any big way that they got 11 guesses out of 12 wrong and they got one right. One in 12 doesn't seem like a very high success rate, but it doesn't really matter when the wrong guesses are costless. So if you don't like Scandal, then they're just like, oh, we don't care that you don't like Scandal, but you liked one of the things on this list. The cost of what you might call a false positive, that is, they guess that you might like something and you didn't like it or you didn't even watch it. That's a false positive. That means they got it wrong. But for Netflix, getting it wrong just doesn't matter very much. At the same time, getting it right is good for Netflix. They recommended something, you watched it, you liked it, that means you're going to be a happy customer and that's a positive thing. But it's also not a life-changing thing. There's nothing massive about your life or even Netflix that's going to go along with a true positive. A true positive would mean they made a guess you're going to like something and you actually did like it. So the true positives are good, but they're not all that, um, uh, all that incredible. And the false positives are essentially costless for Netflix. Now, we'll have some more time to think about this, but you, you could jump to immediately, is, are the same things true in child protection? Is it costless to get it wrong? If I make some sort of guesses uh, based on predictive analytics and I guess that this one kid is safe and this one's not, does it matter if I get it wrong? Can I say like, oh, well, I got it right one in 12 times. That's pretty good. That's all I need. Or would we think that getting it right in, that it takes 12 guesses to get one right, do we feel like that's going to be pretty good for keeping children safe? And I would guess that the answer is no. The, the, th the same thing is true around true positives. If we get it right in child welfare, the impact is, is massive, keeping a child safe, supporting a family in the community. Those things have real consequences for real people. It's not like you could just shrug it off and say, like, ah, we got it wrong. We thought this person might like psych, and it turns out they don't. So I want to come back to this again about what it is that Netflix is trying to do and how much they've made choices here themselves about how, what the trade-offs are they, they want to make in terms of how often they want to get it right, how often they want to get it wrong, how many guessing they want to make, and those types of things. That it's not the predictive analytics that is determining that, but they themselves are making some choices around getting things right, getting things wrong, and, and how they feel about them. I want to use a, another parallel here, not just Netflix, but think about the, the telephone itself. The, the telephone was invented. There had never been a telephone before. And a lot of people thought, hey, this is amazing. Its very first applications were in business places. The bankers used it. And then telephones became a little bit more ubiquitous. They started being things like small towns had them, families had them at home. They were in different places. They weren't just a, a business tool anymore. And when that happened, people started getting scared. You can see the, excuse me, 
the, the headline here says, the telephone is the instrument of the devil. We can all chuckle a little bit about that. Um, I, I, I don't think my telephone is the instrument of the devil, though sometimes with a smartphone and uh, looking at a 16-year-old daughter and how she can't take her eyes off of her smartphone sometimes, I think maybe the telephone is the instrument of the devil. But I think really the, the, this reaction that the new technology is scary is an important, an important one. Let's, let's focus on just one of the, the quotes out of this story. So Ericsson is the same company that exists in Sweden today. They make things like cell phones. But on a comment about how the new technology took off and started becoming something that applied to lots of places, they could say that not everyone was thrilled by these developments. The telephone was often fused with skepticism and not a little fear. There was something magical about sounds coming from thin wire. And many people were afraid that the contents of the lines would spill out in some way as if there was a break. Many elderly persons refused to touch a telephone for fear of electric shock. Others tried to take advantage of the telephone. Some towns, per, some towns persons suffering from rheumatism went to the telephone station in the hope that the electrical impulses received by their bodies would cure them. And there's a, a whole lot wrapped up into this quote. One is that there are some people who are scared. It's new, it's new technology, and it seems magical. I think you could say the same thing would be true about predictive analytics in a lot of ways. It seems something magical. You put a bunch of numbers into some data, some box, and it puts out some great predictions that are going to be really accurate. I, I have, I've heard, quite literally, people talk about their local data analysts as though they were wizards. This person's a wizard. They could come pull things out of there. There's also this idea that somehow predictive analytics is or I'm sorry, a telephone here, is, is a threat, that it can shock you, that something's going to spill out of it, that private data is going to become publicly available in some ways, and we're not doing enough to protect people. And then there's also the people who are talking about, like, wait, I can make a buck off this. I can now offer some sort of flim flam. Yeah, I'm going to sell you this telephone because it's going to start curing you. And there's also the people who believe that the telephone is not only a new technology, but somehow that it's a new technology that's a panacea. It's going to cure everything. It's like snake oil. Got a cough? Telephone will cure it. Got rheumatism? Telephone will cure it. The same thing happens with predictive analytics. You have safe kids? Predictive analytics is going to cure it. You need better trained workers? Predictive analytics is going to do that too. You need families that are going to be more engaged? Well, predictive analytics is going to do that. It's also going to cure your rash and, and make you wealthy. So I think all of these pieces that are here about the telephone all seem, in retrospect, a little bit ridiculous. That the telephone wasn't magical, it wasn't going to shock you, it wasn't going to spill out, but it also wasn't going to be magic, it wasn't going to be a cure-all. Uh, and there is still, though, some threat of people using telephones for nefarious reasons rather than good reasons. I, I, I bring this up because there's a, a there's part of the moment that the United States and, and internationally has been around predictive analytics and child welfare is we're still a little bit in this moment talking about predictive analytics. But there's still a whole bunch of different things going around in terms of people being both trying to offer it as a cure-all, people being scared of it, and very few people coming down and saying, wait a second, the telephone is it's a tool. Certainly we can use it if we use it well. But it's not going to be magic. It's not going to fix all of our problems for us. So this coming out of the both the fear and excitement, the, the, the hype, and coming into a place where we can think about, yes, predictive analytics can be helpful, but let's use it in the best and right ways that we can that we can. So the telephone is the instrument of the devil. Obviously, we can look back on that. How do we do the same thing for predictive analytics? We want to say, like, yeah, it's not an instrument of the devil, but there probably are some things that we should be doing and being careful about. Jump forward about 150 years. This was in the top of my news feed uh, yesterday morning. And it's, so you can see that the, the story there is February 21st, 2017. And the head, headline here tells you 
quite a bit. Redfin chief technology officer says machine learning needs human help. And the fact that that's a headline at all is sort of remarkable. Like, well, you would think so. Yeah, human beings still need to be making choices, making decisions, running these systems. But if someone thought that machine learning and predictive analytics was just going to come in and be like robots that were going to solve everything for us, and it turns out they're wrong, this one CTO seems to be a little bit surprised. I think if they had asked any of us on the webinar today, we probably could have told them, like, yeah, you're still going to need people. If you if you scan all the way down to the bottom, uh, the bottom quote says, however, they're not without pitfalls as the real estate tech company Redfin learned. This part of what's happening right now is that they learned that there are pitfalls. And we want to say to some degree, like, well, yeah, of course there's pitfalls. But it's also just part of the moment where we're at. They were an early user. They jumped in on it, and they learned some things. One of the big things they learned is, go back up to the top of the subhead. The subhead line says, workers have valuable insights that they should add it to the mix, she says. I think that's the key piece to this, is that machine learning predictive analytics cannot, should not, exist in some kind of vacuum. They should be tools that fit into the work that you're already doing and things that are for your workers to be doing better child protection. But they're not going to be replacing your workers. But I, again, I want to sort of highlight this, that there is, a, there is something about figuring out where predictive analytics fits into the mix, moving away from the idea that it's a panacea and that it's magic and it's a cure-all, but also to understand that there are dangers and there are sensible ways of going through it. And one of the most sensible ways of going through it is to make sure that the analytics is partnered with human beings and people who are ultimately the ones who have to make decisions. And when we talk about making decisions, this is a key piece of what it means to do child protection. Child protection is, in a lot of ways, a series of really important decisions. But workers and agencies have to make critical decisions, oftentimes without a lot of information, oftentimes without a lot of time, and the stakes are really high. You're talking about children being safe or in danger and families are having a hard time and needing support. There's about high stakes, short periods of time, and not a lot of information. And in that kind of context, it's easy for decisions to go wrong. Implicit bias, structural inequities, just being in a hurry, a lot of inconsistencies that can happen. You can get it wrong. You can ultimately be uh, unfair in a lot of ways. So what makes for a, a good decision, or how can we know when decisions are being made better, we have better decisions? Usually these four criteria are, are, are a handy way of understanding what's a good decision and what's a better decision. You want decisions that are accurate. They got it right. You want it consistent. You don't want it to be that uh, it depends on whether it was Wednesday or Saturday or that Mike or Cheryl made the decision. That if there's a hotline referral on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. or there's a hotline referral Saturday at 10 p.m., that you're making a consistent decision across them or that if a family from one part of town, a family from another part of town, one worker or another worker, that you're making the same kinds of decisions. Which is different than the fairness question. Fairness, though, can mean more than one thing, uh, and it gets used in a lot of different ways. And this is the place where we'll probably spend the most time today, is around what does it mean to be fair in your decisions? How does it mean to say, I treated all of our clients fairly? Oftentimes, this becomes posed in terms of equity or equality in terms of being fair. Are we treating everyone equally? Are we treating everyone equitably? But those things can often be at tension with each other, which we'll talk about just in a second. And the last part is this useful, that the decision has to be useful in that it actually applies to the, the matter at hand. That's going to help you solve the actual problem. So I could say, I have a problem, I have a flat tire, and then I made an accurate, consistent, fair decision, which is I, uh, I made a decision to buy an ice cream cone. It was accurate because I got the flavor that I liked. I always get that same flavor, and I went to the nearest uh, store and, and gave them a tip. So everything was, it was accurate, consistent, and fair. But was it useful? Did it help me solve my flat tire problem? Well, well no, it didn't. It, it didn't actually do anything for my flat tire. 
So it's important to think about all of the different pieces of what a good decision is. You have to get it right. It's got to be consistent, reliable, not depending on who's making the decision or what day or what time. That it's fair that you're treating everyone essentially in the same way, and that it's useful, that it actually applies to the thing that you're trying to do, your purpose, the problem that you're trying to solve. So if this is what makes for good decisions. We can start asking, like, well, what are the kinds of decisions we make in child protection? A lot of them are who questions. Who should be referred? Who should be screened in? Who should be investigated? Who should a case be open for? Who should be removed? Who should stay at home? These are all sort of who questions. And we can ask about how do we get who questions right? How do we get them wrong? What's accurate? what's fair, what's consistent, what's useful in terms of making those human questions. There are also a lot of questions that we ask in child protection that are who not questions. Who's safe? Who could we leave at home? Who do we not need to worry about? Who's not high risk? Sometimes interventions do more harm than good. So these who not questions are oftentimes the most critical questions of who can we not worry about and leave alone and let them thrive without intervention from CPS or a government agency. There's also a lot of other types of questions. How questions. That is like how should we intervene? How if, how how can services be effective? And there's also questions about why. Why are some families more likely to experience abuse and neglect? Like why have the number of children in foster care gone up over the last couple of years? These are great questions for, for researchers. Uh, and, but and predictive analytics are probably helping them, but they don't quite get at the core of what most of the questions are that get asked in, in practice on a regular basis. So for practice, I, I'm going to really kind of gloss over what the big looks like, uh, the big picture looks like, and this looks obviously uh, pretty different from place to place and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But essentially, the big decision points are things that happen around intake screening and the hotline call. Family gets screened in, they get screened out, you have to decide on something on a response time. Or you're talking about assessing for safety, is the child in imminent danger, who is safe, who's not safe, who could be safe with the plan. Case promotion, case opening, yeah, oftentimes there's a risk assessment, there's some guess about future referrals and the likelihood of which families are most likely to be re-referred in the future, or reinvestigated, or resubstantiated in the future. And you have to make some decisions around who to open a case for and how intensive to serve those families that you open a case. And there's the case planning decisions. A lot of this now gets out to the how questions. How should we intervene? What should we be paying attention to? This is all really sort of on the, on the front end. On the back end, of course, there's questions about returns and case closures and those types of things. Across all of these different decisions, there is an opportunity to be doing a better job on each one. For each one, to be thinking about whether we're getting it right, are we actually intervening for the right families? Are we being consistent across all of our workers, across all of our units, across all the different times? Are we being fair? Are we treating different groups the same way and fairly? Are we treating different ethnic groups, different racial groups, uh, people who live in the rural part of the county and the people who live in the urban part of the county? Are we being fair across all of them? And then are we being, uh, are we actually making useful decisions, decisions that are going to be effective in the end for keeping children safe? So this brings us to the big question then, which is how can predictive analytics help us make each decision better? Is there an opportunity for thinking that predictive analytics is a way to help us make each of those decisions better? So the better really depends, again, on what it is that you're trying to solve, like what's the big problem. Now, if, if in your jurisdiction the big problem was that you had consistent practice, everyone's doing the same thing, all of your workers are trained, they all know the practice model, they all know the tools and assessment, <coughs> but they're not all getting the question quite right. You're not as effective as you'd like to be. You might not be opening up cases for the right families. You're missing. In that case, you're on, this, you're on the target on the far left. You're 
you're consistent, everyone's making the same decision, but it's not accurate. You're missing the target, which is a little bit different than this middle target, which is neither consistent nor accurate. Decisions are all over the place, and no one's really getting it right. And where you want to be is in this right-hand target, which is both consistent and accurate. Everyone's getting it right the same way. That's consistent and accurate. And part of the question then for predictive analytics is can it help these things? And I think there's a lot of people who are making arguments about predictive analytics very much on this basis that say uh, predictive analytics can really come through and support workers so that you don't have uh, so much individual judgment or workers with their own preferences and their own individual biases, and it's going to really um, shore up the consistency across all of your decision making. And the same thing with accuracy, that a lot of people are trying to push predictive analytics with the idea that it can know more and help us get it right more often. But there's nothing about these targets that quite get to the other question, which is equity, about fairness and equality. You can certainly be consistent and accurate overall, but still have underlying differences across groups. Let me take a step back for a second on just sort of a, a, bigger, a bigger view of the question. So if, um, what, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a key and a, and a, key and a lock. And I, I think uh, in, a, in a real simple way, if, um, if you have a lock, then a, a key seems like a solution. Right? I, I have a door I need to get through. The door is locked. That's a problem. I want to get into my house, say. I come up to the door. Door is locked. What's the solution to a locked door? The solution to a locked door is a, a key. Now, here's the key. Is that key going to help me get through that lock? The answer is no. That's a car key. Car key is not going to help me open that lock, even though the solution to that lock is a key. Now, I could take this key and think, this key is an effective solution. Let me figure out what problem I can solve for it. So I could take that key, I could go open my car, I could drive my car, and I could go someplace. So if the problem that I had was I need to go somewhere, then that key is the perfect solution for me. But that key is not the perfect solution for me getting into my house. So there's two ways this can go. If we think that predictive analytics is a key, it's a very cool key, it's a, a technology key, it's a key lots of people are saying is the best key of all the different keys. It is the newest, newfangled, shiniest, most technologically driven key. But if the, that key doesn't actually solve my lock, then it's useless. It doesn't really matter how great it is. It doesn't fit the problem that I have. So one of the things I would encourage everyone is to do is to say, start with your problem and then solve it. Don't start with a solution looking for a problem. Oftentimes what happens in child protection and other human services places, someone will come to a locked door, find that it's locked, not have the key for it, and give up on the idea of going through that door. They'll find a key and be like, ah, I'll go do this instead. I can solve problems that require a solution of a car key. I'm going to go solve that problem instead. And they've abandoned the problem that they actually wanted to start with. So a big question that you should be asking yourself is, when someone says to you, hey, look at this very cool predictive analytics key, is I think the first question shouldn't be, hey, how cool is the key, or how much technology went into it, or how fancy is it, but instead, does it have anything to do with the lock that I'm actually trying to open? And I want to propose that the lock that a lot of people want to be opening, and that we ought to be trying to open, is fairness in the child protection system that we still have in essentially in every state all across the country year after year, differences by race in entries, in kids in care, in time in care, in good outcomes. So we have disparities, we have disproportionality, we have differences by race. And that is a lock that is worth opening. But a key that just says, hey, I could help you drive consistency and accuracy might not be something that's going to actually help you unlock the fairness and racial equity lock. So let's talk just like a little bit more about what, what that is. Now there's going to be a big piece here of breaking down fairness between two really different things, about thinking about the difference between 
equal and equitable. So here's an example of a, a predictive analytic model that classified everybody into low, medium, high scores of, of, of a bad event happening. So say that there's future maltreatment. In this case, it, it, it's getting it, it this is, it's equitable, that the predictive analytics model is equally accurate and makes an equal number of errors for each group. It is just as likely to get the guess correct for an African American family as for a Hispanic family. It's equally likely to get it wrong for a white family as for a black or African American family. This is really in terms of how accurate it is or how likely you are to get it wrong. But here you can see those things are the same. You can say that it's equitable. Now compare that with this which I would say is inequitable, that the likelihood of getting it right for one group isn't the same as getting it right for another group. So you can see here that the middle group is actually, for African American families, looks more like the, the high group for Hispanic Latino families. That is that the, the model then is going to get things wrong more often for African American families than it gets it wrong for Hispanic families. And again, compare it to getting it right more the most for white Caucasian families. So in this case, this is inequitable in that the model itself is weighting its own accuracy and the chance of getting it right and the chance of getting it wrong differently by groups. We'll call that inequitable. Here's a, a different way of looking at some of the same information. So here we have two groups, group A, group B. So you could say group A is uh, families from the country, and group B is families from town, and group A is uh, African American families, and group B is white families, so whatever you want it to be. So let's look first at distribution. So distribution here is, is, is the guesses. It's the number of guesses. So you could say um, we're going to guess just as many groups uh, just as many people as, as Group A are just as likely to have uh, the adverse event. So again, so it's future maltreatment. So we're making really an equal number of likely guesses and maybe guesses and probably not guesses across the two groups. In that case, we could say that is equal, that we are just as likely to make a prediction of, of the adverse event for, for each group, which is different than equitable because equitable has to do with how often you're getting those guesses right. So equal is about having the same prediction, essentially, across each group. Equitable is about having those guesses be just as likely to be right across different groups. So in this case, you can see that you have an equal distribution for each group, but you do not have equitable accuracy by each group. For group A, it's pretty accurate. For group B, it's not very accurate. For group A, you're going to get it right pretty often. For group B, you're going to get it wrong all the time. Compare that with this scenario, where you have different distributions. So group B is actually getting a whole lot more of this blue level guess than group A is. But in terms of accuracy, the two groups are the same. You're just as likely between the two different groups to get the guess right, and you're just as likely to get it wrong. You're just as likely to have errors, and you're just as likely to have good wins across each group. But your, your profile of guesses themselves is a little bit different. So here's a, here's a much less technological version of really the exact same thing. So looking on the left, we see this is equality. Why is this equality? Because each person is standing on the same box. Right? Each box is equal. The same intervention has been made for each person. The intervention for the tall person was a box. Intervention for the medium kid, a box. Intervention for the little kid, a box. They all got the same intervention. They all got the same thing. In a sense, this is the kind of fairness that oftentimes my kids like. I have a bunch of little kids. One of them, their, their shoes wear out. I buy a new pair of shoes for, the, for, my, for my daughter. What happens immediately? My son comes through and says, that's not fair. She got new shoes and I didn't. I'll respond to say, like, she needed new shoes. That's why she got them. You don't need new shoes. That's why you didn't get them. 
And my six-year-old doesn't care. He just wants to say, she got a box, she got a pair of shoes, I want a box, I want a pair of shoes. He wants it to be equal, that everyone gets the exact same thing. Now compare that to equity, which is not. You can see that we did not, in this sense, give the same thing to each person. The intervention was not the same for the tall person, for the little kid, and for the tiny little kid. They actually got different interventions. The tall person didn't get anything. The kid in the red shirt got one box, and then the purple shirt kid got two. The difference here is, on the right, they can all see over the fence. So we didn't treat them equally, but the outcome is equitable. We got it just as right for everybody. Everybody can see across. We got it right at equal rates. So e equality, I'm sorry, equality here, having equal interventions is something that could be really appealing when you want everyone to have the exact same thing. But it's not all that appealing if people are coming from different starting places. That is, a starting place of being tall or being short is really different. Equity, then, is this idea of maybe you didn't give everyone the exact same thing, but the result is, is that you're getting it right just as often for everybody else. I'm going to back to this. Yes. Jesse, it's to Shira. I'm so sorry to cut in on your presentation. However, we are receiving word from folks that not everyone can see the right side of your screen. So going forward, if you can just explain the pictures that may be on the right. Um, for example, some folks are not seeing the child in purple on the far end of the screen on the right side. So that's the portion that's being cut off. And everyone, we will be sending around these slides at the end of today's presentation. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. Maybe we could we could try real quick to see if we could um, change the um, yeah the give us a second. We'll see if we can just fix this. Okay, we, we, we made an adjustment, that, um, and hopefully that helps. If it didn't, then certainly you'll be able to see it afterwards, but hopefully that helps, at least for some folks. Okay. So That's perfect. Uh, okay, so what we have in case anybody can't see is, yes, on the left side, three people who are different heights, all standing on, uh, on the same box, and on the right side, those same three people at different heights, but the, the tallest one of them isn't standing on any box at all. The one who's the medium height is standing on one box, and then the, the child in the purple shirt on the right is standing on two boxes. So now all of them can see over the fence equally well, but they're standing on different, level, different boxes. So I, I will come back to this as, as an analogy. So uh, part of this, I think, question about why would people be at different heights, essentially, when we're talking about child protection. Um, and there are certainly some people who want to say that everyone is the same, that essentially this is the, I, I'm blind to all differences across people, that every individual person needs to be treated as an individual unique person. Uh, and I'm sure there's value to that perspective. At the same time, though, we know from the data and from the research, we know from history that not everyone starts in the same place in terms of their likelihood of becoming involved in the child welfare system, or their likelihood of a referral, their likelihood of an investigation, of a sustained referral, of a removal, of time and care. Like those things are not the same for everybody. And it's not individual level characteristics that make that difference. It's not as though there's just some parents who are bad parents and some parents who are good parents that drive those differences. We know that 
if you live in a neighborhood that got defined by federal redlining rules, that does not have public transportation, that has lower socioeconomic status, that has under-resourced schools, that has densely populated housing, that doesn't have fresh food and good opportunities, that doesn't have parks, that doesn't have libraries, when you're from those neighborhoods, from those communities, from that block, your likelihood of a child welfare referral, of a sustained referral, of a removal into care are vastly different. So if you are part of a neighborhood that has less transportation and higher density, fewer jobs and worse schools, and that neighborhood is made up of more people of color, or more African American families, or more Latino families, then the things that are historical structural factors that really drive child welfare involvement, then all of a sudden now you have one group of people, one racial group, one ethnic group that is going to be referred into the child welfare system a lot more often. Even if you say we're just going to use the data and how much the data show us what risk is. We're just going to use objective predictive analytics. You, you can't separate yourself from the fact that the data themselves come from a system that is not equitable. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't use those data, but you have to pay attention to the fact that the data come from institutions and structures that are not equitable. If you don't pay attention to that, you're going to, whether you intend to or not, propagate, move those inequities forward. You're essentially going to, on accident, say everything that happened with the racial bias and federal redlining, with the fact that banks collude to not put uh, retail stores in some neighborhoods, the fact that some schools are under-resourced, that you're going to take those things and you're going to inadvertently embrace them and make them be your way of moving forward. On the other hand, if you're ready to acknowledge that, that the data come from places that are inequitable, that there are structural inequities, that, the, that not everyone starts from the same place, then you can use those data as a way of highlighting and resolving the inequities. So if we're going to ignore them, then we're going to say, like, look, everyone's the same. Give everyone the same size box. Or we could say, like, no, we can tell from the data we can tell from the research, we know that not everyone starts from the same place. Now let's instead use the predictive analytics to help us figure out what size box everyone needs to stand on so that everyone can be in an equal place. The caution here is to not say the data are tainted because they come from a place of institutional and structural bias. Instead, say, I recognize that the data come from a place of institutional and structural bias. And therefore, I'm going to leverage that to highlight those inequities and leverage that as a way of calling it out of where are our opportunities to actually resolve those inequities. Now, I want to go back to this idea between equal and equitable. And I'm sure that there are some of you who are thinking, ah, uh, I, I don't really want to choose between those things. I want both. I want this to be fair in every way. I want it to be equal and equitable. It's going to be a lot like this kid is sort of trying to find his way through a maze, and he's got to make a pretty hard choice about which way he wants to go. I'm proposing to you here that that little boy, boy, maybe it's a girl, can't go both ways. You can try, but all that's going to do is get you lost in the maze. You're better off thinking through what it is that you really are trying to accomplish. What is it you want for fairness? What is your mission? What is your purpose? I'm going to say, no, can you have both? I, I'm going to propose, and you could disagree, that having both is pretty impossible because of this fact that individual families, individual parents, individual kids don't all come from the same place. They come from different neighborhoods from different communities, from different blocks. When you have high concentration, high housing concentration somewhere compared to a family that lives out in a rural area, if you're loud in your house and you've got thin walls and eight neighbors, the likelihood of a neighbor calling CPS, pretty high. 
If you live out on a rural road and don't have any neighbors, the likelihood of someone calling CPS is pretty low. And that difference between where people come from and the fact that the base rates themselves, the rate of referral from one neighborhood being different than the rate of referral for another neighborhood or a different community or a different group, that's the big reason why having both becomes almost impossible. Let me give you a different example that's from something that's not child child welfare related. Um, so there's a it looks like a, a teenager here with a with a car and look how excited he is. I said before I have a bunch of kids. One of that bunch of kids is 16 and she's doing her driver's ed class right now. And this is what she wants. She wants to be excited about driving her car, the freedom that comes with it. Now of course anybody uh, anybody knows that if you're going to have a 16 year old drive a car, you have to add them to the insurance. So car insurance becomes in some ways, a lot like child protection in terms of this trade-off between equity and equality. Why is that? Well, it's because the likelihood of making an auto uh, a claim against your auto insurance, your car broke down, it got hit, it got stolen, something bad happened, those are sort of bad outcomes. No one wants them, but they occur more often in some communities than in others, for often for many of the same exact sort of reasons. Some places they happen more often than they happen in other places, which means then everyone's base rate is different depending on where you come from. Even if you're just as good of a driver in one neighborhood as someone in a different neighborhood, your neighborhood and where you're from, your zip code, is going to determine a whole lot of the actual likelihood that you're going to get into an accident. Insurance companies recognize that and they say, well, if not everyone's likely of getting to an accident is the same then their rates shouldn't be the same. They shouldn't pay the same amount if their likelihood of having the outcome is different. So what the insurance companies would like to do then is say, people who live in this area or in this zip code or in this neighborhood, they're going to pay higher rates because they're more likely to have the bad outcome than someone who lives in a different neighborhood. We can see right away that there's going to be a problem there. Now what you've done is you've picked a neighborhood which is likely uh, hugely defined by the race or ethnic group of the people that live there, and you said you're going to charge those people more for auto insurance, even if they themselves are not worse drivers. And a lot of people are going to react and be like, no way, that's not okay. So what's happened then is through legislation and through public policy, the rule has been that insurance companies don't get to do that. They don't get to say you live in this neighborhood, therefore your rate is higher. The public policy, the legislation, the rules have said that it has to be equal. It doesn't have to be equitable. The rule is for auto insurance, everyone gets the same size box. It is not everyone gets rates that depend upon their actual likelihood of getting into an accident. Now, I, I, I pose this because auto insurance face, I think, some part of the same dilemma between equality and equity that child protection has, but they resolved it, I think, in the opposite way. They resolved it by saying, we're going to go with equal, not with equitable. Why is that? Like, what, what's the big difference between auto insurance and child protection? The, the big difference is having insurance is a good thing. Uh, not everyone wants to pay for it, of course, but having it is good. There's no one who says, oh, it's such a burden to have insurance. It is a positive thing to have insurance. Look how happy he is. Now he gets to drive his car. He's got his registration, he's got his keys, he's got a license, got insurance, now he can go drive. That's good. Child protection interventions are not always just as good. There are not people demanding child protection come investigate them asking that CPS come into their home and offer them services. That is the big difference between auto insurance is that people are seeking it. It's not being imposed upon them. And it's largely a good thing. And in that case, they've mostly landed on the idea of equal. Everyone has the same size box. Now, I think in child protection, the considerations are different because you're talking about imposing interventions upon people. But really, I'm not trying to suggest that there's a right way or wrong way at this. I'm trying to suggest that when you use predictive analytics, you could use predictive analytics for either goal. You could use predictive analytics to say,
say, I want to have this consistency. I want to have accuracy. I want to have equal interventions for everybody. Or you could use predictive analytics to say, I want to drive equity and understand who should have the bigger box to stand on. But that's not a decision that the analytics are going to make. That's not a data scientist question. That's not a predictive question. It is a values question about what you and your community want to try to achieve. And if the question is, can predictive analytics help us achieve that, the answer is yes. But it cannot answer the question for you. It can help you achieve it once you've made the decision yourself. So a big part of this is like, what, what, what to do here? There are a couple of things that can be done. It can be done immediately. One is, before talking about predictive analytics as a potential solution, is to identify what it is that your purpose is. What is your mission? What are you trying to achieve in child protection? Are you trying to stay out of the newspaper? Are you trying to allocate dollars in an efficient way? Are you trying to reduce the number of kids in care? Are you trying to make sure that uh, there's lower re-referral rate? Do you want fewer child deaths or near fatalities? Whatever that mission is, you need to be clear on it before you can start looking for solutions. Whatever your mission is, you need to be clear first, and then you can identify what are the things that are standing in my way. So if I think, What's standing in my way in terms of keeping more kids safe? I want fewer kids to be hurt. What's helping with that? What's standing in my way to that? Which is different than I want to have uh, a lower re-referral rate. So think first about your purpose and your mission. Then identify what your problem actually is that you want to solve. Then apply predictive analytics to that. So if the question is, for your jurisdiction, you want to have greater equity, you want to have greater fairness, think about how predictive analytics can help solve that problem specifically. The other thing to do here is to really have this big consideration about what, where the problem actually lies. Is the problem you're trying to solve one that is based on individuals? If you could just get individual people to behave, is there something about individual parents that you want to do? That's one thing. It's a totally different thing to say, I want to use predictive analytics to look uh, at a mirror for self-reflection to say, can we use predictive analytics back on ourselves? Instead of putting families under a microscope with predictive analytics, use predictive analytics for self-reflection about what are we doing? How are our own actions helping or exacerbating fairness and inequity? Where are we making decisions in a particular way? What happens when we make this kind of decision? Which units are doing things which way? Why are we more risk acceptance and sometimes and risk adverse another time? Where are we missing? Then the subject of the predictive analytics because it becomes you as an agency and then it becomes an opportunity to use predictive analytics for system improvement, for quality assurance, for continuous quality improvement to say, how do we use this as a learning tool back on ourselves for what we can do better, which is a lot different than saying, I'm going to use predictive analytics to put a number or a score on everyone's head and think like, oh, that mom, she's a 72 red. That family is high, critical, unsafe. Instead, think, what well, can predictive analytics to say, what are we doing? Like, oh, we're missing in these types of cases. Oh, I didn't realize that every time this happened, then this thing happened. When we make this choice, this is the consequence. And there's also a third bucket to say, you could use predictive analytics to put families under a microscope. You could use predictive analytics for self-reflection. You could also use predictive analytics to say, I want to look at what the community as a whole is doing around child welfare. To say, what does predictive analytics tell us really about what our best opportunities are for prevention, for keeping kids safe? And can we use predictive analytics to say, look, here's a neighborhood that we know could use better support and go support that neighborhood in a better way, rather than think that predictive analytics is going to say, this individual parent has a score of 0.725, instead of say, this neighborhood 
is a neighborhood that needs resources. This is a community that needs some intervention. So those, so on the what to do, just to recap that is, first, be utterly clear about what your mission and purpose is. What is it you're trying to do? Then understand what the problem is that needs to be solved. What's the locked door in front of you? Then see if predictive analytics can help you find a key to that door. The second is, don't think that predictive analytics has to be a tool to use to examine families and individuals. It can be equally, if not way more effective, as a tool for self-reflection about your own system reform processes. And third, don't lock it inside of a CPS container that won't allow you to think about the full ecology of families and what makes them more likely to become involved in the system. So that brings us to essentially the, the conclusion of the part that I have prepared and would really like to engage folks around any of the questions that we have around thinking about predictive analytics as a potential tool for digging into equity and equality and fairness in, in child protection. Thank you, Jesse. That was a remarkable presentation and one that our audience really appreciated, hearing the distinction between families, system, and community for ways that predictive analytics can actually target distinct populations and actually be used as a tool for self-reflection for systems. So one of the first questions that we received is actually, I think, about how the tool is actually used and whom the tool is targeting, specifically around capacities. And so someone asked, are predictive modeling tools considering protective factors such as community ties and extended family in their assessment of a family? And if not, how might this be done? Uh, that, that, I think that's a good question. Um, and there's maybe two parts to this question. One is, are people doing that? And the other is, maybe could people do that? Are people doing that? Mm, maybe, maybe not. One of the biggest problems that has occurred in, in the predictive analytics and child protection quest, uh, conversations that have happened so far, is that the, a lot of the people who are trying to promote predictive analytics have been doing it in a lot of secrecy, that the algorithms themselves aren't publicly available, that there's no publicly available evaluation of what's happened, what data got used, how they made trade-offs. For any model, you as the person doing the modeling have a choice to make about whether you have more tolerance for, for getting it wrong in the idea of false positives versus getting it wrong in terms of false negatives. That is, would you rather over-intervene or would you rather under-intervene? And in doing that model, you have to make choices. And it has been very unclear thus far about how anybody has made any of those choices in any of the models that they've been promoting. Now, there's obviously some exceptions to that, and I say NCCD is one of those exceptions, and uh, especially when it comes to race and equity, that a consideration of how models apply across groups is a big one. But the, the question about whether which data get used and whether they're all risk-oriented or all protective things, I, I, I can't actually say, and I wish I could, about whether people are considering them. In terms of what could, can people do, the answer is like, absolutely. Now, it's worth keeping in mind, though, that predictive analytic and machine learning things run off of algorithms. And usually how it goes is you want to give that algorithm as much information as you possibly can, whether it's predictive, uh, well, I'm sorry, whether it's a risk factor, or it's a protective factor, if it's an individual level thing, it's a family thing, it's a community thing. Really, the more data you could put into it and the more diverse data you could put into it, you want data diversity is going to make those models better. So if people aren't putting predictive, uh, I'm sorry, protective factors into their models, um, they, they, they should, and it, they'll have a stronger model for it. But are people actually doing that? There's, there's some secrecy around that. Thank you. Um, the next question is kind of related to that, and that is, what is your experience with child welfare agencies in terms of their capacity to engage, as you proposed, um, using predictive analytics as a tool only, meaning that it's something that is informing human decision making, as I'm referencing back now to the Redfin article. Yeah. So what's your experience there? 